All right, everybody. Good to see you all here today. Let's get the lecture going uh, for this afternoon. How's everybody doing today? How's everybody getting on? Doing all right? Okay, very good. So today we're going to be continuing thinking about energy and motion. So we're going to be continuing the thread that we started on Monday, um, thinking about how energy applies. Uh, but this time we're going to be looking at how energy applies to when things are moving. Now, has anybody done anything like this, done some energy in motion before? Okay, what? Oh, okay, so only a couple of people. Okay, great. So if you have done this before, then maybe you can help out the people who you're kind of um, sitting around. Um, if you haven't done it before, absolutely fantastic. Um, hopefully, you're really going to enjoy this lecture today. Um, oh, before we kick things off, um, before I forget at the end, so in the workshop tomorrow, uh, we're going to have a really good um, challenge question. I think you guys are really going to like it. Um, but you're going to need a device, so a laptop or maybe a, a tablet or something like that to do the challenge question. So if you'd like to do the challenge question in the workshop and you don't have a laptop or a tablet, um, please do, do just let me know, just drop me an email or something. I can sort something out for you, okay? So that's for the workshop tomorrow. I knew I'd forget that if I left it to the end, so just thought I'd get that out of the way there. Um, now, everybody has been getting on fantastically well with all the questions in the lectures, so I really hope they're helping everybody. Great to see people doing so well with the questions. Um, so previously for the past week or two, we've had some slightly more kind of conceptual questions, haven't we? Um, kind of think about things. We've not really been doing kind of too many calculations. So we're going to be having a few more kind of numerical kind of calculation kind of questions in the lecture today. So I thought what I'd do, I was going to call this uh, just anyway, um, a warm up question. But I think given the average temperature in the lecture theatre, I think it's quite appropriate. So um, I think let's just start with a quick kind of warm up kind of maths sort of question. Say you get going, hopefully that will get everybody a bit kind of warmed up. So let's take a look at this question. Now, you might have seen this question before. So if you have, help out the people around you. Uh, have your, your best go at that. Okay, so let's take a look at this question. It's just a kind of quick maths kind of warm up question to get things going, okay? So the idea is um, we, maybe we've gone to a store and we've bought a couple of things. So uh, we've got the prices there. So you want to buy a bat and a ball, that's going to cost you £1.10 and the bat costs £1 more than the ball. So the question is, uh, how much does the ball cost? So let's see how everybody does with this one. Now, if you've seen this question before, maybe help out the people around you, help them to figure out what it is. If you haven't seen it before, that's fine. I'm sure everybody is going to be able to figure out this one. All right, let's take a look at the responses. Let's see what everybody gets for this one. What do we have here? All right, so nobody's going for C and D, um, and then, so about a third of people going for B, and then everyone is going for A. Now, has anybody seen this question before? Oh, okay, a few people, okay, great, great. So if you've seen this question before, you might kind of know what makes it um, an interesting question. Now, the thing with this question is, when we see something like this, and we say, okay, the, the bat and the ball together, they cost one pound 10, and then the bat, you know, costs one pound more than the ball. Um, it's very easy when you think, okay, well, in that case, I guess the ball, it's, it's got to be uh, 10p, right? So that, that kind of seems, you know, it's one pound 10. But if we think about this, okay, so if the ball is 10p and then the bat is a pound more than the ball, then the bat is going to be one pound 10. So together, they would cost one pound 20. So even though it seems quite straightforward, if the ball costs 10p, then they won't add up to what we're getting. So what we get when you do the math, and I guess what you guys get, is that the ball only costs 5p, okay? So then the ball is 5p, bat is pound 5p. Together, they're gonna cost pound uh, 10, okay? So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. Um, now, this certainly was a kind of good warm-up question to get the lecture started, but there's actually a kind of more important point that I'd like to make about this question. So 
Does anybody know where this question is from, if you've seen it before? Oh, yeah. Ah, Elon Musk's favourite question. Okay, good point. Do you know, I didn't know it was Elon Musk's favourite question, but I'm not surprised it is because um, it's actually one of my favourite questions as well. Um, does anybody know where the question was from originally? Maybe where Elon Musk saw it. Oh, yeah? Is it something to do with Einstein? Ah, okay. Um, so it's not actually something to do with um, Einstein, but it was actually from... Um, someone else who actually um, did win a Nobel Prize, but not for physics. So who has seen this question before? So you saw it from Elon Musk somewhere, or did he tweet it or something? Ah, like oh, okay. Oh, oh, right, when he's hiring people. Ah, okay, okay. Well, that might be useful for all you guys if you ever end up uh, <laughs> having an interview with Elon Musk. Uh, where else has people seen this question before? I, I'm curious to know where people have seen this question before. So where this question is um, originally from, it's one of my all-time absolute number one favorite books, really one of the, the very best books that I've ever read. And I would highly, highly super recommend to all of you guys to uh, give this book a read. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic book and super important for really everybody if we're studying things like physics. Um, and I think um, it sort of illustrates are one of the reasons why it's Elon Musk's favorite um, interview question. So I'd just like to spend one slide talking about this book and why it's going to be so relevant for all of us when we're thinking about learning <laughs> physics. So the book that this question is from, it's actually called Thinking Fast and Slow by uh, Daniel Kahneman. Has anybody seen this book before? Okay, so this is an absolutely fantastic book. Uh, honestly, if you really do only read, you know, one book in the next year, this is just such a fantastic book. Um, if it was up to me, I would make this book sort of compulsory reading for anybody graduating from university. It is just such a good book and so important. And especially when we're thinking about how we go about learning uh, physics. Uh, so for me, my um, research background, as I've mentioned, it's actually in astrophysics. But one of the interests that I've developed is actually understanding the science of how people go about learning physics. And a huge part of that is really informed by these um, ways of thinking um, that are kind of really described so well in this book. So as you may be able to get from the title, Thinking Fast and Slow, what this book is all about is two different ways of thinking. So we can have uh, thinking fast and we can have uh, thinking slow. And the sort of central hypothesis of the book is that whenever we're thinking about a problem, there's kind of two separate systems, two separate ways of thinking that we can use to approach a problem. So I'd just like to um, expand a few details about that because it really is important for us. So Whenever we're thinking a fast, that's what Kahneman calls system one. And then this thinking slow, he calls that system two. So these are just two names that he's given to these two different ways of thinking. Uh, now, he's clear that it's not like we really literally do have two separate kind of parts of your brain, separate areas of your brain, like a system one and a system two. But the idea is that we can kind of think about how the brain solves problems in terms of these two different systems. Now, system one, the thing about that is it's easy, okay? And it really says, okay, well, just whatever you did last time, it's probably just the same again. It's easy to kind of jump to conclusions. And the thing is with system two is it's difficult. You know, it's hard work, it's kind of taxing, and if you do a lot of system two thinking, you're gonna get tired out. Um, but system one, it's intuitive and it's almost like you can't not do something with system one. So if you see a word written in a language that you're fluent in, you can't look at the word and not read it. You just can't point your eyes at that word without reading it. It just kind of goes directly into your brain. Or if you see a familiar face, you can't look at that familiar face without recognizing who that is and what their name is. It just happens reflexively. You don't have to kind of think about it. Whereas maybe if you're learning a new language and you've just started and you see a word in that new language, 
you don't recognize what it is immediately. It takes a bit of time to figure it out. So to contrast that, whenever we're doing system two kind of thinking, it's intensive. It doesn't happen automatically. It's something that you really have to sit down and you have to figure it out and you have to figure your way through. So, you know, maybe if you're learning a new language or if you're learning a new musical instrument, you don't just pick up a guitar and you can play it fantastically. You know, it's hard work to practice at it. So that's uh, a bit about how system two works. Something we've got to watch out for with this system one is that it's overconfidence. Um, we can almost think of this as it thinks it's better at solving problems than it actually is. So whenever we see a new problem, something we don't know how to solve, something we're seeing for the first time, essentially what happens is the system one says, don't worry, everybody. I've got this. I can figure this out. OK, let's not disturb system two. There's no reason to disturb system two. Let system one handle it. I'm sure it's not going to be that difficult. And it's very hasty to jump to conclusions and just kind of take a quick guess. Now, the reason, then you might think, okay, well, that, that, that sounds like a bit of a kind of, uh, you know, not a great way to go about solving problems. But there is actually some kind of sense behind it. And the reason is that system two, it's hard work. Um, and it really does take um, energy. So, you know, we're learning about energy this week. And if you want to do system two thinking, it really does take energy. So all the, all the stuff you're reading, you really do burn that stuff up in your brain when you're using your system two to thinking. It's hard work and it takes a long time. So if you're in a situation where food is scarce and you need to come to quick decisions, system one is useful for your survival. But if we're in a situation where you know, our calorie needs are generally not scarce and we have time to think about problems. We need to be thinking a bit more about system two. Now, what's the relevance for physics? The real connection is that whenever we're solving new problems in physics, it can be very tempting to try and think, OK, I'm going to solve this problem with system one. What's the quickest, easiest first thing that I see without going to solve the, with the kind of system two approach, okay? And in a nutshell, one of the reasons why physics graduates are so in demand and their starting salaries are so good, it's not necessarily because of any particular um, familiarity with any particular physical theory. It's because, in general, they're very good at using system two to solve problems. If they see a problem that they don't know how to solve immediately, they're experienced and they've got that practice there to figure out how to solve it. The last thing I'll say about solving things with system two is that it is hard work and it is difficult. So if you feel like learning new stuff in any of your modules at university, if you feel like it's difficult and you feel like it's hard work, Remember, you, that's absolutely right. You're doing it absolutely right. If you feel like it's kind of too easy and you're not really getting stretched, you're only ever really using your system one. You're not practicing your system two there. So if you do feel like some of your courses are a bit kind of hard going and it really is sort of hard work, that probably means that you're strengthening, you're building your system two. And that's such an important part of what we're trying to get out of uh, learning physics. Let's move on to the kind of main subject of today, thinking about energy in motion. So on the subject of uh, Elon Musk, um, I've got this picture here, really nice picture of a uh, Tesla Model 3. Don't you guys think that's just a, a, a pretty nice car over there? Um, and what we're really going to be thinking about today is the energy involved in getting this car moving. So it's just kind of sitting there but we'd like to get it driving off into the sunset. How much energy are we going to need to do this? Now, do any of you guys um, have a car or kind of drive regularly? Maybe you're sort of driving. Oh, OK, some people do. So, so and you kind of drive into campus every day? Yeah. OK, well, what, what car do people drive? I drive a Fiat. OK, well, what, what kind of Fiat? 500. Oh, very nice, very nice, Fiat 500, great. Uh, and other people, what, what do you guys drive? 
Oh, okay, okay, uh, neat car, great. Any, any other drivers, or is, is that about it? For, oh, yeah? Oh, of course, okay, okay, so it's a very nice little car. And in fact, there? Oh, 100 jazz, oh, that's quite cool, cool. Do, do we have any other drivers here? Is, is that for, yeah? Rio Clio and, I know what? Oh, I said Leon, oh, that's very nice. Okay, so, um, so I think I mentioned before, so I used to teach um, in the States, um, and when I asked them there, does anybody have a car? Every, does anybody drive? Everybody just kind of looked at me like I'd kind of taken leave of my senses, because in the States, asking if anybody drives, it's kind of like asking you guys if, if anybody has like a pair of shoes or something like that, you know? It's just like, of course, everybody is gonna have a pair of shoes. You know, maybe in the whole university, there might be a small handful of students who go about their day without wearing shoes, but you know, that's a bit of a kind of unusual thing, a bit of a niche thing. So in the States, when I asked that, everyone was like, what do you mean, of course, of course we have cars. Uh, so it's interesting, some of you guys have cars. Has anybody ever been behind the wheel of an electric car or a hybrid? Ah, oh, okay, what, what, were you, what electric car were you driving? Um, my boyfriend's had two electric cars. He had a BW ID3 and he's currently got a Cougar. <laughs> oh wow, very nice. Very nice. So he's already moved on from the ID3? Yeah. Oh, great. Did you get behind the wheel of that? Yeah, I have. They're, they're much different to like. It, it is, right. What did you think? Okay, guys, let's come here. This is actually quite important. What, what did you feel like when you were behind the wheel of the ID3? It's, it's the instant talk. It was just there. The instant. Did everybody hear that? The instant talk. This is a really interesting thing you get with electric cars. So with a petrol car, <laughs> you put your foot down. And eventually, once the engine gets going, it picks up, right? But with the electric car, all of that torque, all of that turning force we learned about, you get that right from the offset. And the, I mean, it's really sort of fun to drive, right? A really nice driving experience. Um, has anybody else been behind the wheel of an electric car or a hybrid? Uh, yeah? Okay, uh, which, car, which, which car are you behind the wheel of? Volvo V60 and also Yaris. Oh, okay. Are they, um, are they hybrids? Okay, okay, so when you're in, in electric mode, you get that, yeah. you get that in instant talk. <laughs> yeah, so it is a different kind of driving experience. It's a lot of fun being behind the wheel of an electric car. Um, so we're actually kind of thinking about this example here of we have a car and it's just sitting there and we're gonna get the car driving up to some speed, okay? And the way we're gonna do this, we're gonna have to do some work on the car here. So that what we're really thinking about is how much work are we going to have to do to get our car up to a velocity we're just calling the velocity v. So maybe the velocity we're just driving around, you know, town 20 miles an hour or we're on the motorway, you know, going 70, something like that. How much work are we going to need to do to get our car up to a velocity of v? Now, who remembers what uh, work is? How can we figure out how much work we need to do? Anybody remember from last time? Maybe take a look in your notes, see what we've got for, does anybody have? Ah, oh, so those are the units, absolutely right. Joules are the units. But how do we actually go about calculating some work? Force times distance, absolutely right, okay. So we're gonna do some work and work is force times distance. So we can kind of think about this. Um, we've got our car sitting there and we're going to do some work. You can almost think of this as if we're kind of pushing the car along, doing that work, exerting that force. And we're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep pushing the car, keep doing the work until we reach a velocity of V. That's the kind of model that we're building to think about how much work we need to do. Now, very often when you're solving physics problems, it's really helpful to be clear about things that you know about the problem, things that you're assuming about the problem, and things which are unknown, things you don't know. Maybe we're going to have to figure them out or kind of think a way to deal with them. Have a think about some of the things that we're going to know about the situation, some of the things which are assumptions, some things we're going to be assuming, and some of the things that we don't know, maybe we're going to have to deal with them in a bit. So I'll give you guys just a moment to have a think about that, maybe have a chat with the people around you. I'll see what everybody thinks for this one. Okay, so great to hear everybody having a bit of chat about this, thinking about some things that we know about this, 
some things that we might have to assume, and some things that we don't know that maybe we're going to have to figure out. Okay, so maybe let's start with the, uh, the knowns here. Uh, what are some things that we're going to know about the situation? Any thoughts? What are we going to say? That, oh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Does everybody hear that? So we, we're going we're gonna to assume that we know the mass of the vehicle. So, so in this case, you know, it's a Tesla Model 3. We know what the mass is. But, you know, if you guys are driving something else, we can see what the mass is. Okay, so absolutely fantastic. Okay, that's very good. We know the mass. Now, is there anything else that we're going to say? Okay, we, we know what this is about the situation. Are uh, you? Yeah. Ah, so we're talking about the, the 0 to 60 time. Okay, so that is a good point. Okay, um, but I think let's actually keep that in a bit more of the maybe more towards the something we might assume. Okay, I think the only, ah, uh, yeah. Ah, great. What's our initial velocity? Zero. zero. Did everybody hear that? Really good point. So our initial velocity is zero. We're assuming we're starting from rest. Great point. So we're assuming our initial velocity. And then also, we're going to say we, we know what our final velocity is as well. Okay, so in a sense, we know what our, our delta V is. So those are some great uh, knowns there, okay, velocity and mass. Okay, so that's a great start to this situation. Let's move on to the assumptions. Did anybody think of anything that we're going to have to assume about this question? Any thoughts about that? Anything we'll have to assume? Does we have one there? Okay, well, 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 what's, your, what's your idea? Air resistance. Air resistance. Okay, no, that's a great one. So we're assuming air resistance. So I think one that I'd like to suggest is, so we're assuming that we know what our mass is. And in this situation, let's assume that the mass, it's not going to change. So our mass is constant. What do you guys think about this assumption? Do you guys think it's a good assumption or not so much? Think it's a good assumption? So... Even if we're driving a petrol car, you know, we are going to burn a bit of petrol, but that's not going to really change the mass of our car too much if we're just thinking about accelerating. But in an electric car, if we're just using the charge and the battery, that's not even going to change the mass of the car at all. So I think we can assume constant mass. That's going to be a good assumption for us. OK, did anybody else have any other assumptions? Now, I liked your thought about we, if we know the zero to 60 time. So if we, if we know that, what that kind of means in physical terms is that we assume that our force is constant. So the whole business when we're going from rest to whatever, we, you know, whatever our speed is, we assume that that force is going to be constant. So do you remember what you said about the, the, um, the torque with the electric cars? So with an electric car, this is a very good assumption because we get all of that torque, all of that turning force right off from the go. So in an internal combustion car, this wouldn't be such a good assumption, but it actually wouldn't be a bad assumption. But certainly for an electric car, let's assume that our force is going to be constant. So it's at rest. We're going to apply a constant force, keep applying that force until we get to the velocity that we need. Now, what about the unknowns? What are some things that we don't know about this situation? What are the things we don't know? The motion of the road. Motion of the road. Oh, that's a good one. Incl oh, inclination. Oh, that, that's, a, you know, that's a very good point. So we don't know the inclination of the road. I guess we've not specified. Like, now, I think I might group that under assumptions. I think let's assume that our road's flat and, it, and it's just a straight road. I think let's, we could have kept that under the assumptions. I, I think when we think about the, the unknowns, suppose you saw this question on the exam, you know, how much work are we going to do? Oh uh, yeah? Oh, great point, great point. And what else? Oh, fantastic. Everybody hear that? We don't know the distance. We don't know the time. Great points there. We don't know the displacement we're going to go. So for the work, we need force times distance, and we don't know how long it's going to take, do we? You know, if, if you just saw this question on an exam, and it was, you know, how much work do we need to do to reach, you know, 50 miles an hour, you'd say, ah, well, uh, you know, you're not giving me the displacement there. You know, work is force times distance, but you've not given me what the distance is. And um, if we think about acceleration, well, we don't know how long it's going to take. 
So does anybody have any thoughts? How could we get started cracking this problem? Any thoughts about this? See some people, do you want to? Ah, okay. So that's going to be a part of it, okay. Um, but what I suggest, even before we get to that, thinking about the equations, my, remember my number one tip whenever we're starting a new problem is to start by drawing a diagram of the situation. And I think when we're getting to thinking about maybe Suvat equations, that's going to really help us make sure we use the right one. So let's start by thinking about a diagram of this situation. So do you guys remember a couple of weeks ago we think about kinematics? So what we're thinking about is what is our graph of velocity versus time for this situation? So we don't know what the time's going to be, but we can still sketch the graph. So let's see what everybody thinks for this one. So something that I really like about energy is that it really brings together all the different concepts that we've been thinking about recently. So we spend a bit of time thinking about these kinematics concepts. So have a think about this one. Which of these graphs is going to show the velocity versus time if we have a constant force? What's that going to mean for our acceleration? OK, let's see what everybody thinks for this one. Ah, OK, so some people going for, we've got some people going for all of these. Most people going for A. So we can rule out C. Why could we rule out C to start with? Any thoughts about that? Oh, uh, yeah. It, right, very good. Everyone hear that? So, so option C doesn't start from rest. But um, option C, it, it, once it's got going, it does have, it is just a straight line there. So let's see what we've got here. Okay, so remember, we're not changing our mass. And we're assuming that the force is constant. So if our force is constant and our mass is constant, that means our acceleration is going to be constant. Uh, so the only graph here which is a constant acceleration is graph A. Oh, oh it's gone behind the thing. But A is the correct answer there, OK? Um, so very well done, everybody who gave that one a go, OK? So this is a great place to start thinking about the question because we can now start to figure out the pieces of the puzzle that we're going to need. So one of the things that we didn't have, you know, one of the unknowns, it's the displacement, you know, how far are we going to need to push the car for? So how can we go about thinking about what our displacement is uh, from this graph? Any thoughts about that? Oh, yeah. Fantastic. It's the area under the graph. And that's why it's so useful to, to draw the graph. So remember, if we have a graph of velocity versus time, the area under the graph is going to be our displacement. I think that's what we can get at with the, the Suvat question. So let's have a think about this one. OK, so given that sketch and given what the velocity is and what the time is, what's going to be our displacement? So remember, our displacement is going to be the area under that graph. And remember, the area is going to form a triangle to give you a bit of a clue about what that displacement is. So think about what's the base of the triangle, what's the height, then use that to figure out what the area is. OK, let's see what everybody gets for this one. What's our displacement going to be? Oh. Oh, oh, oh it's, 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 it's given the game away. But it looks like most people got that, didn't they? So distance is a half VT, OK? So remember, if you're not sure about that, uh, don't try and memorise any equations. Don't just try and pick for the equations that maybe you think look familiar. You don't need to guess with this, and you don't need to memorise any equations. Our displacement is always going to be the area under the graph. The area is a triangle. The area of a triangle is half base times height. So that gives us a displacement of a half VT. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. I'm going to write that down because it's going to be handy for us. So our displacement equal to one half VT. OK, very good. Now, remember, we're trying to figure out how much work we need to do. So our work is force times distance. I, I know we, you, we previously used S for displacement, but the thing is, when we're thinking about work, it's almost always written as force times distance with a, a D for displacement. So for this lecture, I'm using a, a D for displacement. 
So our work is our force times distance. And we've just figured out what our distance is. Okay, so that's great. You know, we've kind of making really good progress, done half of the puzzle here. But we can't calculate what our work is, and we need to know what the force is. So let's try with the next question, having a think about what our force is if we know what our final velocity is. So we've got several different options here for what our force is going to be. And remember Newton's second law of motion, we know that force is mass times acceleration. So we've got force is mass times acceleration. We're assuming we know the mass. So what we're really thinking about is what's the acceleration of our car? Now we're assuming the car starts from rest, goes up to a velocity of v. We don't know what the time is, but we can write it down time t. So let's have a think when we put all those pieces together, what's our force going to be? Okay, let's see what everybody gets for this one. What is our force acting on the car? Okay, most people going for C. Okay, so remember, so force, mass times acceleration. So it's going to start with the mass, and then we're just thinking, what's the acceleration? Well, acceleration, it's just our change in velocity over time. Our change in velocity is V, our times T. So correct option is answer C there. Okay, so very well done, everybody who gave that a go. Now, we're making fantastic progress here, really getting on really well. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write this one down here. Okay, so we now know that our force, it's equal to mass times our velocity over time. So this is really great. These are kind of all the pieces of the puzzle that we need. So we're trying to figure out what our work is. And we now have the distance. And now we've got the force. So you might be able to guess what the next question is going to be. What do we get when we put all the pieces of the puzzle together for how much force we're going to need? So that's what we think about for this question. I'll get it going. Let's see what everybody thinks for this one. So again, with this question, you don't have to guess. You've got everything you need to figure it out. We know that work is force times distance. We know the force and we know the distance. So we just need to do the math, work through the algebra. What do we get for the work that we're going to do? OK, let's see what everybody gets for this one. OK, so quite a few people going for A. And not so many for B, they're not so many for C, they're not so many for D. Okay, so very well done, everybody who gave this question a go. Now, I think, uh, let's write some stuff out here. So, we've got that this is our distance, and this is our force, and work is force time distance. So, it looks like, as most people have identified, when we multiply them together, we get m times v over t from our force, and then the half vt. So it looks like quite a few people spotted that that's what we get when we combine them. Now, at this moment, before moving further with the physics, I just like to kind of recap the stuff we started on at the beginning of the talk, thinking about, you know, the bat and the ball and the system one and the system two, because I think this is a great example of why it's really important. Because if we think, okay, well, that's the force, that's our distance, so the force times distance, that does give us option A. Now, does any, can anybody spot where we could go from there? Any thoughts about that? Oh, yeah. Exactly right, everybody here. So we can simplify this a bit, okay? We don't have to stop there. So let's see what we've got there. So, um, We've got a V from the force and a V from our distance. So that's going to give us a V squared. And then we've got a T over here from our distance, but then we divide by T from our force. So the T's are going to cancel out. So when we do the simplification, what we end up with is option B there. So the half MV squared. So very well done, everybody who gave that question a go, especially if you got option B. And I think the thing I'd like to emphasize about this, when we're solving physics problems in the workshops or your revision or thinking about exams, make sure you're always really exercising 
that system two. Because remember, your system one is overconfident. It's going to say, I've got this. I've got this. We don't need to disturb system two. Use all that energy, burn all those calories. Think about the problem, OK? Just leave it to system one. But we really do need to engage our system two to really figure this one out. And I'm sure you guys are all able to, you know, crunch the math and figure that one out. So very well done, everybody who got that one. What I'd like to think about now, this is actually a very important uh, quantity in physics. Um, maybe you've seen it before. So in physics, what do we call this quantity? One half mv squared. What do, we, what do we call that? I'll get the question going. Let's see what everybody thinks for this. So in fairness, you can't really figure this question out if you don't already know it. But I'm sure if you ask the people around you, um, someone in your group, you're going to have a good idea what it is. Maybe you've seen this before and you know what it is. So give this question your best guess and we'll see what everybody thinks for it. Okay, let's see what everybody gets for this one. What do we get for this question? Okay, all right, so nobody's going for D. And I think you're absolutely right. So people going for C, this is what we call the kinetic energy. So who's heard of kinetic energy before? Okay, okay, so great. So if you've heard of it before, so this is where kinetic energy comes from. What it represents is the work we've done to get something moving at that speed. So if we have a car driving along 40 miles an hour, we know that at some point, something has done this much work to get the car moving. And remember, energy, it's always conserved. So we've done uh, work, that's a form of energy to get the car moving. Once we stop doing the work, once we stop accelerating the car, once we stop pushing, that energy just doesn't disappear. We say that that energy is now in the form of the kinetic energy of the car because the car's moving. And that means that the car has an ability to do work. It has an ability to exert a force through a distance. That's what we mean by that. So very well done, everybody, with that question, OK? Now, the last question I'd like to do for today um, is another one related to this idea of conservation of energy. Let me just get the question up and we'll see what we think about this one. Okay, here we go. So with this question, um, this question is all about conservation of energy because we know energy, it's not created or destroyed. It just changes from one form to another. So last time on Monday, we learned about gravitational potential energy. Today, we've learned about kinetic energy. And this question is really about the conservation of both of them. So what we've got here is the situation. We've got like a roller coaster. We know the height of the roller coaster, say it's height h. Roller coaster is going to roll down the hill, and we can use conservation of energy to work out how fast the roller coaster is going to be going at the bottom of the hill. So I'll get this question going. Let's see what everybody thinks for this one. So again with this one, you don't need to guess with this question. We've got everything we need to figure out. We know that energy is conserved. So at the top of the hill, our potential energy is mgh. At the bottom of the hill, that energy is going to go into the kinetic energy of the roller coaster. So half mv squared. So we can figure out the velocity, what the velocity is just with a bit of algebra. We just need to set these two equal and solve for v. So see what you get for that. And I'll take the responses in a moment. All right, let's see what everybody gets for this one. What do we get here when we do the math? OK, nobody's, nobody's going for C. Uh, so this is really, we're thinking about conservation of energy, and we can figure out what it is just with a bit of algebra. So we just need to set these two equal, add, solve for V. And when we do that, what we get here, we get the square root of 2GH when you do the math. Now, if you're not sure about that, that's absolutely fine. We're just starting to see a bit about conservation of energy. So we're going to have lots of practice questions about this at the workshop. Uh, we've got plenty of practice with this. I'm sure you guys will get the hang of it. 
Now, the last slide I'd like to show you guys for today, just to wrap things up a bit for this week. Um, just thinking about this picture we started with back on Monday about the, uh, the Falcon 9 launch by uh, SpaceX. So I thought this was quite a cool picture. And we've now this week thought about two very important um, aspects of energy going on in this picture. So today we've learned about the kinetic energy of the rocket. So as the rocket's taking off, as it's accelerating, it's got a mass, it's got a velocity, it's going to have kinetic energy, absolutely essential component of a rocket launch. And then last time, we saw how to work out what the gravitational potential energy of the rocket is. So as the rocket's increasing its height, it's gaining gravitational potential energy. And remember, energy is conserved. So both of those forms of energy, it's coming from the rocket fuel, which is launching the rocket upwards. Now, there's one other very important and very visible kind of energy in this photo. Can anybody spot, anybody have any ideas what the other kind of really important form of energy in this photo? Oh, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Thermal energy. OK, so we can see from here we've got all the flames all the rocket fuel combusting, thermal energy, absolutely crucial form of energy, very important for so many physical processes, okay? So we're going to be learning about thermal energy over the next couple of weeks, okay? Another very important form of energy, okay? So that's a great point to wrap things up today, okay? Fantastic work, everybody, today with all the questions. Uh, we got a really great result there with the kinetic energy. Just a reminder, we've got the workshops tomorrow. If you do want to give the challenge question a go, bring along your tablet or your laptop or let me know and I can sort something out for you. But great work today. I'll see you all tomorrow. So I'll uh, see you then.